All right, thank you everybody for your patience as we try to get everybody here together. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to Mind and Body Self-Care, staying mentally fit and physically fit as we celebrate this Black History Month um, coming to a close today. We are, uh, I guess we have a few more days, but welcome. And I'm excited to introduce to you all lots of wonderful community members that will be sharing their expertise with us today. And I'll just go ahead and list them. We have uh, Dr. Otis Williams, who will be representing the Department of Counseling at Bowie State University. Um, and hopefully we can have Camille Butler come in, who is the advocate and educator for families with sickle cell anemia and the sickle cell trait, and also the founder of Journey to Happiness. We have uh, Crystal Beckford, who is the VP of Patient Care Services and Chief Nursing Officer at the Doctors Community Hospital. Um, Darren Stevenson, who is a high school administrator, behavioral intervention specialist in Prince George's County Public School System, as well as Greenbelt Cares, uh, Reverend Ray Razor, who is the constituent service specialist for the county council chair, um, at Calvin S. Hawkins II, and I am Lindsay Vance. I will be your moderator for today. I am an art therapist and licensed professional counselor, and I am also an art administrator and educator doing lots of different things in the community and the surrounding areas. I'd like to start us off today with just a land acknowledgement, recognizing that we are standing on land um, of those who come before us, particularly the indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land. And so I wanna just start us off in making sure that we acknowledge all of those who have come before us. I am in Washington, DC, and I stand on the land of the Piscataway and Anacostian people. And I know that this workshop is taking place all over Prince George's County. And so therefore I'd like to acknowledge also um, the, the various indigenous groups that inhabited those lands, including the Mattapatnet, the Patuxent, the Piscataway, uh, the Moye and the Pomonki, uh, those both past and present. And without further ado, I wanna just jump into this panel today. We have some lovely folks here who are gonna begin with just sharing their experiences with us and who they are and what they're bringing to the table. And then we'll do some questions and then we'll wrap up with some questions from our audience members. So please join us. I'm gonna go ahead and take away the, the slide with our information on it, just so that we can um, see each of our panelists uh, and we'll get started. So welcome everybody once again to my lovely panelists. Thank you for being here today. And if we can start uh, with Dr. Williams, if you wouldn't mind just going ahead and introducing yourself, letting us know uh, why you're here today. Sorry about that, I'll mute myself. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Ms. Vance uh, stated, my name is Otis Williams. I am Associate Professor and Department Chair of the Department of Counseling at Bowie State University. Um, I'm, I am also a co-advisor of our student organization, which is the African Psychology Student Association. In terms of experience, um, before coming to Bowie State, I was uh, an adjunct professor at uh, Johns Hopkins University. I've also worked uh, in a prison and juvenile detention uh, facilities as a mental health clinician. So I've worked with uh, male and female inmates as a uh, counselor. I've worked also in Prince George's County as a behavior specialist at a non-public level five school. I've also been a special education teacher in Baltimore City. Um, so my experience in terms of um, populations, really I've worked with individuals from six to probably 70. Um, but most of my experience I would say would be with uh, black youth and young adults. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I guess we'll go over um, to Crystal Bedford if you would share with us today who you are and what you're bringing to our, to our panel today. Absolutely, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Crystal Beckford and I am the Vice President of Patient Care Services and Chief Nursing Officer at Doctors Community Medical Center here in Lanham, Maryland. And so I've been uh, with the Luminous Health Organization now for uh, this past year. I'm coming up on my one year anniversary, um, but I've been a registered nurse for over 32 years. And so I've had the opportunity to serve in the way of healthcare and to provide healthcare and recovery uh, to patients from newborn uh, uh, to the end of life. 
And so I'm honored to be a part of this. Again, in my 30 years of experience, I've probably worked everywhere at the bedside from the critical care area to your med surge area. But really in the last 15 years, I've had the honor and privilege uh, to serve in leadership role. And so prior to coming to Luminous Health, I was actually on the side of healthcare in the insurance sector. So I was with Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield for eight years in their patient-centered medical home as a nurse executive. And then prior to that, um, I was actually a chief nurse officer in the state of Florida. So I've had an array of experience and an array of opportunities to really in influence and shape healthcare, um, and more importantly, uh, to educate around healthcare. So I'm excited to be here with you and to share some self-care and um, mental health opportunities. As a nurse, we compromise of comprise of over anywhere from 59 to 70% of the healthcare workforce. And so we're a big part of the everyday community. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing what we're doing in the way of well-being and, and what people can do in the way of well-being as well as mental health. So thank you, Lindsay, and glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And it's so great to have so many, you know, wealth of knowledge. It sounds like we all have been in lots of different pockets. So we'll have a rich, rich conversation here today. Um, I'd like to invite next uh, Darren Stevenson, if you if, if you would um, come off mute and, and share yourself and, and who you work with with us today. Absolutely. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for getting on. Now, I'm kind of a small fry. I mean, y'all some two great introductions. I hate to come behind you two, but I'm going to try. So uh, I'm Darren Stevenson. I have a master's in counseling. I'm a counselor behavior specialist for Croom High School, which is the alternative program for the south side of Prince George County. I'm a part-time family counselor for the city of Greenbelt. I work with the families over at um, Greenbelt West and for Spring Lake Recreation Center. And I'm also the lead counselor for the Walk-In Counseling Center for PG Schools on Thursday night. So I've been doing it for 30 years. I'm from Philadelphia area. I've been in PG schools for 15 years, and I'm here to help you understand the, the, the world that our teens are living in. It's a lot going on. It's a different world. So I got a lot of feedback about, you know, uh, coming down to that level and seeing it from that, from that, uh, from that perspective. Now, Mr. Stevenson, we're going to ask that you don't minimize all of that 30 years of experience ever, ever again. You are just as qualified to be here as anybody else. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Reverend Ray, can I get you to come on and, and share some with us as well? I know he was having some technical difficulties, so I'm not sure. I see that you're in here, but are you able to um, come off mute and talk about what you're doing in the community? All right, perhaps he's not there yet, so perhaps we can come back to him. And I don't think that um, Camille Butler has joined us. Um, like I said, she was going to talk with us about the sickle cell anemia. Hopefully she may get on as well a little bit later. Uh, well, let us just go ahead and jump in and get started. And, and we kind of just want to have a conversation today. And I, I'm going to start with a question just about what does wellness and self-care mean to you? Uh, and I think that that is a good place to ground us in as we get started in this conversation today. And if anyone would like to jump in first, feel free and then just pass it along as we go. I would hate to jump in front of a female. I'm, I'm going to defer. <laughs> So can I, this is Crystal Beckford. I'd love to start off um, uh, with that. I think um, I can say that being a nurse of 30 years that my whole mindset is nursing and wellness. And so you'll hear me come from that perspective, um, but I'll also share uh, my personal perspective as well, as well as what I've seen in the community. So one of the things when I think of about um, what does uh, wellness mean to me, and, and that was the question is, one of the uh, true forms of wellness that we can achieve, especially in the African American community, is when I think about wellness, is making sure that we are make, getting our annual checkups in addition, that we're making sure that our children are doing that. 
Um, that that annual check in um, both um, with your healthcare provider, um, as well as when you think about dental health is extremely important and, and, and is definitely a way uh, to stay healthy and to stay well. And so I immediately think about that from a healthcare perspective and how important that is and how sometimes that can take the back burner because there's so many things uh, that we're doing at any given time. Um, but I also think about in general, when you talk about health and wellness, it's important that you find what works for you uh, from a health and wellness standpoint. Um, and so that means taking care of your mind, body and spirit. Um, and that means um, that you're addressing all of those and those don't go on the back burner for those who may be on the call who are mothers who are taking care of their families. And so I think of regular exercise, um, also of eating right, um, you know, for some meditation works. Um, for me, uh, the exercise with regular running uh, works for me and daily exercise works for me. Uh, it is very true and there is science behind of making sure that you're drinking plenty of water um, a day. And so those are some of the things that immediately come to mind when I think of health and wellness. There is another piece in the African American community because sometimes the, the mindful part of it or the behavioral health part of it is left behind is that sometimes we're going to pray through things. And when you need help, <laughs> there is absolutely help in the community that is available um, and that we need to make sure that we're taking advantage of and that we understand that there is a real true and illness are related to mental health and that we have to decrease the stigma in the African American community so that the um, the uh, services that are needed are actually accessed by our community. That that's beautiful and I, I want to just I'm going to uplift a couple of those moments because you started out with um, these annual check-ins that are so, so, so important. And, and I would like to throw not only just those, those physical check-ins, but also those, those mental health check-ins. Yes. I think that that is one of the things that we have not normalized, particularly in our community. And I heard you say that towards the end, that that is a part of it. And so thinking about the whole, whole part of us, like not just a piece of us, but our whole beings and what that means to actually really be well. So thank you for that. I'm going to go ahead and throw it to you, Dr. Otis. You know, um, it's interesting because uh, I too think of uh, wellness and, and health and self-care as something that's, that's holistic. What's interesting is that I teach the psychopathology uh, class at Bowie State. And so one of the questions that I asked uh, students is, you know, what is mental illness or what is pathology? Um, and so with no hesitation, we're able to um, you know, ramble off what it is and what it looks like. You know, we have a DSM that's like 900 pages and so forth. And then I followed that question with uh, what is health or what does mental health looks like? And that's where we kind of um, have issues or have troubles talking about what is health. Um, I think because our society emphasizes so, so often so much in terms of pathology. Um, but for me, health and wellness and self-care in terms of it being, um, uh, important, anything for me that promotes life. Um, and I think that this is a universal definition because when we talk about pathology, you know, that's very specific to various cultures and so forth, but I would submit that all cultures, um, regardless, um, I believe that we have the built-in propensity to sustain life and our bodies make up those things um, or possess those things uh, that promotes life. And so when we start to act contrary to our natural purpose and our, our, our natural inclination for life, I think that that's, um, I think that that's health and that's wellness. And I think that takes place in the physical form, whether it's social, whether it's mental, whether it's spiritual. Um, for me, uh, personally, it's being at peace. Um, I tell folks, that's kind of like my motto, please do not disrupt my peace. Um, and so when I'm at peace, I feel as though um, I'm, I'm in my wellness space or I'm in my space where I am uh, self, self-caring or taking care of self. And when I'm at peace, I feel as though I'm connected to others. I feel as though I'm, I'm connected to nature. Uh, I'm connected to self. And so that connection, um, uh, with, 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 with nature and people and so forth, it's, uh, I think it's what's key for me in maintaining my peace and my wellness and taking care of myself. 
That's beautiful. I like that, that, that connotation that if we just hold that peace, right? I like to say joy. Joy is one of my mm-hmm. things. I think if we can, if we can strive for that and everything, then you'll find that peace. So that is, that's a beautiful sentiment. Um, I see that Reverend Ray, you look like you have, you've gotten your mic working. <laughs> so if you want to introduce yourself real quick, um, yes. and then we can get back into to what wellness means to, to you all. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Reverend Ray Rachel. I uh, work um, for uh, a councilman at large, Mr. Kevin Hawkins in Prince George County. I'm on his staff. I am the constituents uh, liaisons. And, uh, and also, I've been uh, doing peer counseling with persons with disabilities since uh, boy, 1988 uh, with DC Center for Independent Living, where I still am a peer counselor. But also for a couple of years, I was the national, matter of fact, the only black national field rep for a guide dog school traveling throughout the country to do assessments for persons to get a guide dog be in the assessments was because to see how mentally and emotionally they could handle uh, not only their disability, but being able to be a caretaker, uh, a caregiver for a, 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 a dog. So, and, and now uh, as uh, being in my capacity as a constituent service uh, with this pandemic, especially as uh, Mother Teresa said, the worst, uh, the, worst uh, sick, the worst illness in the world is isolation. And that has become a so, uh, I mean, just so prevalent, especially in the disability community because so many people uh, in their homes, or uh, they have caregivers, uh, PCA personal caregivers that, uh, because of COVID, they stop, you know, they stop caring and coming to the people with disability homes to care for them, and uh, and then a lot of people with disability can't get out to go shopping. So the mental uh, illness has really just really shot up uh, in the uh, disability community, and it's something that we're dealing with. And Zoom is a blessing and a curse. Zoom is a blessing because people can at least uh, get on these different uh, meetings and stuff like all over the country and stuff. But on the other hand, a lot of people take for granted everybody has email and everybody has Zoom. And that's not true, uh, especially in the disability community. It's very few uh, people have uh, the finances to be able to have, first of all, you got to be able to have a computer, which even though they're cheaper now, it's still like four or $500 up. Then you got to have internet service. Uh, You got to pay for that. And then for people with disability, especially the health of baths, like for his, what I have here, I have software called JAWS, and that's a talking screen reader that costs $1,200. And then you have to have somebody train you <laughs> how to use this stuff. So uh, we're really, really struggling uh, from an emotional and mental uh, situation in the disability community. And this is something we're dealing with every day. So we're going to you know, different places and trying to uh, get assistance for people, people to be just connected. I mean, just to be connected mm-hmm. is the biggest thing in terms of you know, people's mental health. So I'll stop there. Well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction and and letting us know um, what you're bringing to the panel today. I think it's it's a very important topic that we would be remiss if we didn't cover. So I'm I'm so happy to have you here. And and I think it is also, like you were saying, something that not everyone thinks about. And and having the ability, I know that we've come a long way in our virtual world to be able to have transcripts and and having um, interpreters and all sorts of things. But those are definitely things that are not always at the forefront of the work that we're doing. So I'm happy to have you here to be able to share that with us. Uh, We began this conversation uh, just recently, so you didn't miss too much, but we are talking about um, what does wellness and self-care mean to you? And and I know that it it looked like, uh, Darren, you may have some some things to say about that, and we can hop back over to Reverend Ray. Absolutely, absolutely. I like everything that's been said so far. This is a a much needed uh, forum. Uh, wellness is important. It's a, it's a way of life. It's like now it's a matter of life or death, you know, because a lot of folks are really struggling out here mentally, physically, emotionally. But I live in solitude. That's a place where I live. Right. And, um, it, and it's a state of being alone without being lonely. 
and it can lead to self-awareness. That's what solitude is. I can go to a place in my mind and escape everything. I don't need vacation. I don't need all those other things. You have to really do a lot of soul searching today, especially when you work with younger people, because they, they're big on grandiose and what's in front of them and immediate gratification, and it's hard to slow them down. So you have to wait for teachable moments that I call when you're working with young folks. But wellness and solitude, that stuff is the utmost important, especially when you're a, a, a level-headed professional, because it's not easy to help people who really don't want help or who don't know how to ask for help. So I spend a lot of time you know, chasing folks and kind of being persuasive uh, for, for people to see things from a different angle to really uh, help themselves, because self-help is your best help. Helping yourself is the best kind of help. So it's just hard to motivate young people these days, but I, that, that's one of my biggest concerns and one of my biggest strengths is getting them to see it from a different angle. But wellness is definitely important. All right, thank you. Uh, Reverend Ray, did you have something you wanted to add on, on what wellness and self-care means to you? Um, wellness and self-care. <laughs> Uh, one of the things when I was traveling, and even now, I'm the president of several organizations. I also host and produce two talk radio shows a week. One is called Sight and Vision Disability and Senior Talk Radio Show, where we have uh, people, we have reps from different organizations come on and talk about products and services for people with disability. The other is I do a show called uh, CAG do Capital Area Guide Dog for a person that have guide dog. And one of the things when I was traveling, uh, I would ask people, what's the reason they're getting a guide dog? Uh, one of the top three answers would be it increased their social life because especially with white people, maybe not so much with black people, but especially with white people, they will they will gravitate to you if you have a dog. They'll come over to you and say, oh, that dog reminds me of Duke or King or whatever. And so they'll start a conversation with you and all of that. Um, and, and so now, because of COVID, people are not coming up to you, uh, you know, with a dog. Some people do, but some people don't. And so people, you know, it's the reverse thing now. Matter of fact, uh, when I would take my dog out, I'm on my number seven guy dog named Raven. When I would take Raven out, yeah, there's nothing for, you know, people to come up and run and run up and talk to you and ask you about the dog and all. But now, you know, people just stay away from you and they'll holler because uh, blindness in this COVID situation, we really are being isolated because I mean, face it, a blind person to assist a blind person, they have to touch you, okay? <laughs> so people not touching blind people right now. <laughs> so they not assisting you. They might holler and say, turn that way. I mean, like when I'm going across the street, not with my dog, but with a cane, people will run up to me and grab me. And even if I don't want to go across the street, they dragging me across the street. And I say, no, no, I was just standing at the corner waiting for somebody. But now that don't happen. They'll holler and say, no. Don't go that way. Go this way. Go that way. So, and so just circling back what you're saying about the, the mental uh, wellness is for us in the disability community. Uh, I mean, already people think that if you touch a person with a disability, you're going to catch something. So now even more so, uh, it's really becoming a problem, especially with the Black community. For some reason, no, I won't say for some reason. Still, from slavery time, when a black child was born with a disability, if the if the master knew it, if the slave owner knew it, he killed the baby. So black people learn to hide the disability or compensate the disability for black kids. Now, unfortunately, even today, black people are still ashamed of their black kids that if they have a disability. And one of the things we find, I find out and we find out that the black kids with disability, they don't, they don't get um, they, you know, they, they, they don't get noticed or they don't get diagnosed uh, early enough and they don't get the services and all because the black people still, and then even if you go in your black churches right now, they they don't even have where they accept uh kids with disabilities and stuff or make it uh wholesome. So it, it, even more so now, now what now, so black people with kids, they 
like I say, they don't get the services and all, but they don't want to recognize that their child have a disability. Now, what white people do when they when white people had kids with disability, the parents get together and they start organizations and stuff and everything. There's not one black organization that's a decision maker or own uh, by black people for people with disability. Not one. All of them are white. Okay, so anyway, those are the kind of things that we, we, we're really struggling with. So in terms of health and wellness, uh, you know, that, that's what I'm, I'm working on every day, just trying to re-educate, well, I don't know about re-educate, but educate uh, families and all in the Black community. And I don't, you know, and I, and I don't make excuses or apologize for Black people. I mean, Black people who I live with, I'm Black and all. And those other folks, they take good care of themselves, like the Asian people. How often you see an Asian, well, when, when you did was out and about, how often you see an Asian person with a disability out in the street? You didn't because they take care of their own. Latino people, same thing. So anyway, you know, it, it's a whole culture thing that we are working with. And one of the things that came to me this, this month, because I am the president of a couple of uh, uh, blind organizations, uh, there's two major national um, uh, uh, blind organizations in the country, and one is the uh, National Federation of the Blind that has over 50,000 members, 700 uh, chapters, and on their board of directors, which is 17, they got three Black people. Of uh, the 50 states, they only have four Black uh, state uh, of, uh, of presidents. Uh, the American Council of the Blind has over 10,000 people. Uh, and members and on their board of 17, they only have one black. So all the interviews and all I've been on this month, basically us, you know, talking about, you know, how black people uh, want to feel, black blind people feel about uh, being part of the organization. And I realized that, you know, we are the point now, we don't have to keep begging these people uh, to uh, take care of us. We don't have to keep begging them. Uh, we need to, you know, black blind people, we need to start taking care of our own self. So those some of the struggles that we'll have, and that's probably more than you want to hear. But anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And you you brought up a couple of very important themes. And, and one that is very interesting to me is that idea of solitude where Darren is saying he's living for that. And we have folks who in that solitude are also struggling. And, and particularly now during the pandemic, as we have been forced into this um, isolation that we, have, we haven't been used to. And so I think um, if you were already feeling isolated at this time, you're probably feeling more and more isolated. And so I I think that those are some things that we can definitely lift up and talk a little bit more about today as well. I have also noticed that um, Camille has made it, so I want to give her an opportunity to, to check in with us and introduce herself. And, and we are just in the discussion now on um, what does wellness and self-care mean to you. So if you want to join us and share that portion, um, we'll, we'll add you into the conversation and then I'll circle back to a couple other things I heard. Thank you so much. And my apologies, I came out of an appointment late. So I have to preface everything I say with that. So my apologies. But I jumped on um, at a, a very uh, good part of the conversation. And yes, there were a lot of good points that um, were brought up. So again, uh, my name is Camille Butler. Um, I had started a nonprofit called Journey to Happiness Movement uh, approximately five, a little over five years ago. Um, I advocate for the sickle cell trait community. Uh, many times, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on sickle cell disease and, and I, I understand why, um, but um, what I have found is that the sickle cell trait community um, doesn't get as much attention. And um, we talk about wellness and um, just, just mental health, everything. I think there's... Um, so many pieces to it, but uh, one thing I wanted to bring up just because I was, I thought about it when I heard the conversation when I just jumped on about um, people with disabilities sometimes being shunned. And it's, it's similar to um, sickle cell disease. A lot of times they're, they're shut out. Um, there's been some um, discrepancies in terms of how they're treated, you know, with medicine and, and so forth. Um, and I'm not gonna to go too deep into that, but what I will say with sickle cell trait 
what has been like a trending message that is sent amongst our community, um, people of color, is that uh, if you have the trait, you can uh, live a normal life. You don't have to worry about anything. All is well. You don't have sickle cell disease. So there's nothing, you know, no real concern. And that's the message that is, um, you know, most often sent um, to people with sickle cell trait. I am a carrier. Um, my daughter uh, was also a carrier, but she um, passed from a cancer called renal medullary carcinoma. And uh, that cancer is, is, can be attributed by, let me say that, can be attributed by um, sickle cell trait. And there's just not enough research right now to actually say that this is what causes it, but 99% of those cases are uh, patients with sickle cell trait. Um, and what I found through that experience of watching my daughter um, be diagnosed and within five months pass away at the age of 13, um, I realized and I felt that I was not given a chance to advocate. I did not know I, I knew that I had the trait, but again, I was always told there was nothing to worry about. And so I learned that, you know, although, you know, the medical community, you know, of course, there's a ton of research for sickle cell, but I think we have to just empower ourselves and understand that, you know, doctors aren't God and, you know, mm. none of us, like we all have to play a part. And I think I relied so much on the medical industry and that's, you know, I'll just blame myself for that, but we have to realize that we have to put, we have to empower ourselves and we don't wait for a doctor to tell us what the symptoms are. We have to um, really do research on our own. And uh, in hindsight, I realized maybe there's some things I could have done or there were, you know, signs there and not, and not trying to be a downer or anything, but it's really about self-advocacy. And we don't get that a lot in our community. Um, and so that's really, you know, not to be long-winded, but there's so many pieces to this, um, but I wanted to be in on the conversation um, as a whole. So thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. And that was a perfect segue actually, because I think um, some of the things that Reverend Ray was saying also is that we have to be, here for our community. The idea of staying mentally fit, staying physically healthy is not an individual thing. It, it really needs to be a community and collective piece. And I think that that is what we have been missing and we are really in need of right now is how we come together and support one another. And, and I think part of that is like what we're doing here today is sharing the knowledge, right? And, and, and giving each of our expertise in ways that are um, you know receivable by many members of the community, but also, you know, I think we have we have some work to do is what I'm hearing y'all say. I, I hear that we have relied on the, the medical systems and we've relied on places, but we also understand that we are in a country where oppression is real, racism is real, and we have really had some systemic issues that have not given us the best of care. And so it is up to us to seek out that better care. And so I'm wondering, um, as we continue this conversation, um, what are some ways that you all or maybe your organizations have implemented self-care or even this community-based care during the pandemic um, and maybe some examples or, or some resources that we can share with the audience here today. Well, you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. So, you, you know, uh, Ms. Vance, you, you mentioned in terms of um, society. So actually we live in a culture and a society where it's um, almost as if we have to go out of our way to practice self-care. Um, it's like those things that are not good or not healthy for us are probably the, the most accessible things um, in terms of diet, in terms of exercise. And, um, and that's prob it's probably set up like that on purpose. I mean, if we live in a capitalist society, um, right, we, we don't do things, um, our lifestyles are not set up to prevent illness. Um, there is more intervention, um, and we know with intervention, there comes more, more money, more profit, more revenue, and so forth. Um, but in terms of what we've done, I would say at Bowie State, starting with myself, is that um, making sure that we connect. Um, and so hearing the other panelists talk in terms of um, people wanting to isolate themselves or stay away from others with disabilities, um, I've heard the same in terms of 
our elderly, you know, with COVID, people are not reaching out to the elderly. Um, so COVID has, um, in many ways, um, kept many of us isolated. So what we started at Bowie was, although we were working remotely or uh, virtually from home, we said that we're going to meet every week on Zoom, um, or we're going to meet at a destination and social distance and so forth. And this was before we were able to come back to campus. Um, but we looked for ways to connect regardless of the pandemic and so forth. Um, because as African people, what, what makes us human is, is that there are other humans. Um, so we realized it. And that's the concept of Ubuntu. And our wellness, our health actually depends on that connection with other people. Also at Bowie State, we started what we call the Wellness Week, where we uh, canceled classes for that particular um, day. And we had people throughout the campus community come up with their own wellness um, events or activities in terms of, um, actually we canceled classes that entire week, but um, the wellness activities that we set up was for a particular day. And so the community was just filled with these events. Uh, one of the things that I um, initiated was what we called a nature walk, where we just walked around campus and we um, talked about life, we talked about nature, and we tried to be more conscious or cognizant of the nature or the natural things on campus that we don't normally pay attention to as we are racing across campus trying to get to class or trying to get a meal, um, but just trying to be in that particular space. Um, I often tell my students that we're often in a state of becoming um, where we're going to the next um, class, we're going to the next event, or we're even thinking about the next activity. And rarely do we have an opportunity, or we have the opportunity, we just don't take advantage of the opportunity to be um, and be and be in that space and pay attention to um, what's going on at that particular moment. I tell students as I'm actually talking, you're probably thinking about the drive home or work tomorrow or what you have to, you know, what's going to be for dinner and so forth. Um, but in terms of self care and in terms of what we're doing on an organization and individual base, um, for me, the key is connecting and maintaining that we maintain that connection with other people. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to add to that, Lindsay. I do want to just provide some, just a couple of qualifying statements um, of things that have been said previously. Uh, you know, structural racism and systemic racism is very real. <laughs> and it doesn't matter um, if you can uh, control for some of these things. Like, you know, you can go to school and have five degrees behind your name. And, you know, there's a lot that you, you can move in the suburbs and sort of outside of the city. Um, you know, you can do everything that uh, you can to maintain your health and well being. But uh, being black in America <laughs> that comes with the stressors, being a black woman in America that comes with sort of the superwoman or superhero phenomena is a very stressful. And, and, and those are things uh, that when you talk about controlling for um, become almost impossible. Um, and so you're still going to be faced with some of the same challenges uh, that people who are less educated uh, uh, that you find yourself next to who may do better in the healthcare system or do better with healthcare than you. And it's, it's extremely real day to day. And that's why, you know, as, as a society of, of, of black people, of African-Americans, we need to continue uh, to educate people in healthcare, whether it be nurses or doctors, that people that look like us, that have the same experience as us, so that you don't have to go each time and explain the black experience or what your experience is. <laughs> And that there's some familiarity with that. And so that is just so extremely, extremely important. And then to Reverend uh, uh, Razor's comments, I happen to have a 23 year old son with disability. Me and my husband have raised three children, three African-American men um, who's 24. And I, as a nurse had to advocate for three years for a diagnosis for him, which it was very real to me. And I knew very early that something was off and that he had a disability and at some point he was diagnosed with Asperger's, but there is a significant amount of advocacy, even if you're in the healthcare field of trying to get people to understand what your experience is. And, and, and again, we have to put this to a stop there. There's that, that we are going to have to do something different. Um, that is absolutely for sure. 
Um, but as I think about what our system has done um, when it comes to uh, behavioral health, I hope that those that are on the phone that are aware of that Doctors Community Hospital is due in June um, to open up our behavioral health pavilion. And so we'll be opening up a, a pavilion on our campus here in Lanham, Maryland. We will be starting with outpatient mental health clinic, and then we will be having an inpatient unit, psychiatric unit with 16 beds, um, and that will open up in December. So that we, services are very much needed in the Prince George County. Um, it, you, you can't take people who need the service of mental health to the police department. <laughs> you, you have to take them to the right area. And so we are honored and excited about being able to soon offer uh, this service here in Prince George County. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, what we've done for our healthcare workers who this two-year pandemic has drawn on long for all of us, and, and so it's tiring and it's taxing, is that we have done a lot. We have made some adjustments to our workforce so that we have more workforce flexibility. We do have weekly well-being opportunities that people can participate in. In addition to that, we have what we call an Excel room where there are massage chairs and people can come in on their breaks and we really encourage breaks um, that they can come and sit down and just relax and you know try to rejuvenate um, and then we have an excel cart that we take around regularly um, we have tea we have coffee we have different things on it that we can offer people so that's just a few things that we've been able to do wow that that's amazing and i didn't know about that that pavilion coming so that's exciting to hear and i'm happy to hear that there will be some additional resources because you are right there is a lack um and and prince george's county is quite large and the yes. amount of resources that are there um is devastating quite honestly considering um the large black population that also inhabits that county so i am happy to hear that there's something coming as a mental health clinician myself personally um and and there's one other thing that i want to lift up that you said and, and maybe you didn't even realize, but this idea of rest as our liberation, right? Um, giving giving the nurses rest, giving them the opportunity to come and just sit in a massage chair during a time where there's just so much going on. And I don't think we understand and value rest enough and how much it does for us and how much it continues to um, facilitate some of the wellness that we're seeking. And, and it's because we don't have time to rest, it seems, right? With all of the urgency of all of the things Things happening, um, as you were saying, that the structural racism is real, right? And it is embedded in everything. I have found myself also having to advocate on behalf of myself um, and like telling folks, like, you know, actually, I know what's going on and this is what I need and still have been refused services. So it is very real. It, it is a very, um, you know, almost taboo subject that we haven't even talked about as a community as much as we clearly should have. Um, and so I, I'm hoping that those of you out there listening will recognize that sometimes you need a rest, right? You need that as the form of liberation. You need that as the form of this is how we're going to keep moving. This is how we're going to be well um, so that you can come back and continue to do the work on behalf of the community. So thank you for sharing that. Um, would anyone else like to share some, some things that your, your organizations are working on to continue to promote this it looks like Camille I saw you come on so if you want to go ahead and share thank you my phone dropped <laughs> um uh, one of the things when when we first started we had a, a health fair in the community um and doctor's hospital um was involved and some other um local organizations um just to again push the wellness piece fitness was a big piece of it we work with the University of Maryland um and I brought that up because um, I'm also an educator. And so there's been also an initiative to look at how we are educating our youth um, with, um, again, the focus being on sickle cell trait and also how it um, is involved with sex, sex education, which generally starts around eighth grade um, through the high school years, um, because there's um, that discussion that all should, also should be discussed in, in regards to sickle cell trait. Um, once you know that you have it and knowing that should you partake in sexual activity and you have a baby, um, of course, if both of you have sickle cell trait, then um, you could have a child with sickle cell disease. And, you, you know, so bringing that into the conversation at an early age is not something that we should wait um, to discuss. 
Um, and also I've been a part of the sickle cell um, steering committee for the state of Maryland, um, where that focus has been sickle cell disease, but I've also been um, just advocating for sickle cell trade. I feel like we should be on a united front um, because obviously it, you know, it does take the trait to get the disease. Um, so I've really been trying to advocate um, for people to, if they don't know um, what their status is for sickle cell trait to be tested. Um, every child, at least in the DMV, I believe in all states at this point, if you are born, the, the test is given. However, um, only 30% of the time is that information communicated to families because again, the message has been that it's not as important. Uh, so that's something that, you know, if you don't know, we are urging um, people just to find out and know your status and know what, you know, what that means. Thank you for sharing that. And, and uh, you raise a great point around this advocacy piece, right? We've kind of mentioned it in several different pockets, but we really do, um, not only do we need to advocate for ourselves, but we have to advocate for the, the things we know and, and sharing that knowledge so that folks can then know that they should be advocating. I think many of us would know or do it if we knew we were supposed to, you just sometimes don't know. And so I think that education piece is very, very key. Um, I wanna leave this, Question still here, um, Reverend Racer or Racer or um, Darren. If you all want to jump in, um, feel free. Um, yeah, yeah, go yeah, Red, you got it. Okay, you know one of the things that um, I have found that's a little distressing, and I always have to go back to the black community, is that, uh, and I encourage more and more black men now that we have to. You, you know, most most of most of the achievements in the black community has fallen on two things: the black woman's shoulder, as a sister say, the super black woman, and the church. And you know, because of the whole Willie Lynch thing, and I'm not going to go through all that. What Willie Lynch did uh, to get us where we are now, and it's still working. Uh, with the you know light skin against the dark skin, the good hair against the bad hair, the the, the slaves in the field that's dark against the slaves in the house. And, and if you look through that, through government during the 60s and 70s, you see where white people are very comfortable with light-skinned people, regardless, uh, you know, how smart they was and wasn't and all. But the thing is, what I want to circle back to is for us, understand the history, how we got where we are now. And a lot of us understand it in our head but we just haven't accepted it in our heart uh, because there's no way in the world at 41 million people, black people, and the kind of money that we, we, we create um, that we don't own anything. And when I say own, and, 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 and you know, when I hear, I just cringe when I hear they say that Prince George County is the most wealthiest county in the world, black people. No. What, what they don't understand, what they mean is Prince George County, uh, people make $100,000, $200,000. We're not wealthy. We might be rich in terms of uh, getting that money every payday, but once that money gone, you don't have that $200,000, $300,000 uh, uh, home mortgage that you can pay. But we don't own anything. We're not the people that own the land. We're not the people that own... Uh, 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 you know, a distributor company or a manufacturer company, because uh, once that $200,000 job gone, you know, that's the end of that. So one of the things is that's a lot of stress that uh, from week to week, month to month, you got to make that kind of payment. You don't have the kind of money and if you miss three payments, you know, you, you could be just, uh, you know, just a step away from be, being on the street like a homeless person. But, but, but going back to what I have noticed in other societies that they do, and I try to encourage black men, that we need to mentor. You need to have a mentor and then you need to have a mentee. And because we need to train each other and have, and have we belong. And you know, there's a book, there's a book that came out a long time ago and said, I don't want you to get to know me because you might not like me. You know, because we don't share like like women do. So women are share and and all, but with black men, we you know we don't share. 
And, and and a lot of times it's all right for us to get together and cut up and do the dozens and all of that. But we should be talking about, hey, brother, you know, economics. Do you have, a, you know, what kind of work you do? Maybe I can, uh, you know, use your services. Or I mean, it's a shame to say that in Prince George County here that folks be the wealthiest count of black people, we do not have a grocery store. OK, we got mega churches that have read 15,000 members, uh, uh, you know, uh, all of that. But yet we don't have black, uh, we don't have a black grocery store. How crazy is that? We get out of church on Sundays that we jumping up and down with each other and passing the basket. But yet when we leave there, we run over to the Chinese store to buy food. We don't go to a black store. So it's something <laughs> that's, there's something really wrong mentally or psychologically with, you know, with, with us. And we one of the most educated uh, counties supposed to be, you know, among black people. When you look at the council, you look at the council, there's 11 people on the council, most are black. But when you find out who is in charge of the Prince George County uh, Credit Union, it's, it's not black people. Okay, so, you know, we, we just, uh, uh, we just got to be educated and, and look at some things that's really going on to, to get our health and get our mental, emotional, and then physical health back together. This is still a county with wealth as we supposed to be. This is still a, this is considered a food desert. And, you know, a food desert where we got, you know, Popeyes, Wendy's, you know, all these places, you know, right, right and, and walking distance of each other, you know. Uh, being on the council, I had the opportunity to be able to sit in on meetings with uh, different um, organizations and companies and stuff that 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 uh, you know that wants to come to the county and stuff. And and we lost places because um, some of these uh, companies don't feel that they have the kind of education that. Uh, they did a survey, uh, Amazon did a survey, and another company did a survey. They went to the school, to our, to our elementary schools, uh, to, see, to, to see what the kids was learning, okay? So they decided not to uh, have, <laughs> they decided not to open up factories and stuff here in this area and all, because they said, well, what the kids are learning in our elementary school they wouldn't be the kind of workforce they need in 20 years, okay? So we, 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 we got some work to do. We got some work to do. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna give it to you, Darren, and then I have a couple of things I'm gonna interject. Hey, Camille, how you doing? It's Darren from The Rec. I just wanna say hi to my girl, Camille, first. <laughs> and um, hey, you guys are saying a lot of important things, a lot of factual things. And you're right, Rave, the bottom line, we need a lot of work starting with us as men, right? I work with young men all day long, all three jobs, and it's very, very hard to get our, our young men together. But in their defense, they, they miss out on a lot of things, right? Destruction of racism, not having black male teachers, the, the men in their bloodline, not spending enough quality time with them, all that good stuff. I got a master's degree with, with 30 credits. I've been a counselor for 30 years, and my father been in jail 48, uh, my 53 years. So it's just a lot that we have to endure as men. And we need um, we need to get a, a, a strong body of men to come together and show some leadership to help the youth come along. Other than that, we're gonna have to depend on the women. So you, it's like equating Mother's Day to Father's Day. It ain't the same. You know, you can't, you can't conceptualize the time that girls spend with their mothers and aunts to what boys spend with their fathers and uncles. So we got a lot of work to do, Rev, but we gotta do some talking uh, behind the scenes to try to pull us together. And that's all I wanted to say. I, I think you also there make a great point is that we got to do it with our youth first um, and, and we got to do it broken, right? Uh, we we got to come together even if it don't look right. We got to come together even when we don't have all the answers just yet, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the hardest part when doing this work um, because, you know, we are, we're asking you to start with yourself, but sometimes it's difficult to start with yourself. So mm -hmm. sometimes you need to get together with two and three others who don't know where to start and just figure something out. And I think that that is the, the catalyst for this community and this collective healing that we're seeking, right? Is that we, we know that all of these things are against us, but we're still here. 
right? And we have been, and we continue to be, and our body's innate thing that it wants to do is survive. And so at this point, we're surviving, right? And, and even when all the odds are stacked against us, we're surviving. But I think our community is saying right now is that it's ready to thrive. And so I, I want to kind of move us and shift us into that solution oriented and maybe strength space where we can figure out what does it look like for us to actually have these things, right? Have those grocery stores, um, have some ownership, have some investments that are our own so that we can then come back and, and, and create that generational wealth, create that generational wellness that we're seeking. And so I'm hoping that you all have some ideas or some thoughts or some things that you've been working on that you can share with our audience today on what it looks like to thrive and how we kind of move in that direction. So I'm going to open it up again. Well, for um, I've actually, <laughs> my dissertation, um, was on uh, the institutional racism and black owned businesses and actually stemmed uh, from my observations in uh, Prince George's County. So I, I grew up mostly in Prince George's County where I noticed that as I went shopping, you know, whether it was Avison Mall, whether it was Forestville, um, Prince George, um, Landover, wherever, I, it, it was apparent that um, African descent people were not the owners of these shops. Um, and then we talk about, as the Reverend and, and others have talked about, the um, so-called wealth or the income of Prince George County. And I strongly feel as though the county has been and continues to be under attack. Um, and I think this is by deliberate. I think this is a plan. Um, I think when you leave out your home and you don't have a grocery store this within two miles, um, if you don't have several grocery stores that are within two miles, as I have observed in other counties, um, there is something wrong. Um, there's something wrong when we look at our school system and the amount of tax you know people pay and uh, and so forth. And I think that there is a systemic attack because we know what happened back in 1921 with with Tulsa, and I think that since then, even before then, um, I've, white folk vowed that there, there will never be another Tulsa. Um, there will never be a community such as that because that gives us um, the, the, the foundation in which we can grow and make these changes that we're talking about. Um, and I think Prince George had the greatest potential um, to do that. And I think that's why they, they have continued to be under the attack. But I see this as nation building. Um, in order for uh, us to be, if it's a nation within a nation, First of all, um, in terms of consciousness. So like Africa, you can have all the resources in, in the world, but if you don't have the consciousness in terms of what to do with those resources, then you'll just be returning those resources back to um, other communities or you'll be financing other communities. Um, as other conscious speakers have often said, with all of the talent that black people have um, in these United States and even beyond um, in terms of music, entertainment and so forth, but we do not own one um, music uh, producing um, piece of technology. Like we don't, we're not Sony, we're not Yamaha and so forth. We're, we're not the awards um, program and so forth. So other people are making money from our talents and our skills um, and our abilities. So I would say first seeing ourselves as a people, which many black people, that's like they don't have that consciousness in terms of we are black. Um, regardless of where, if you were born in the United States and Africa or, or Europe, because um, when you have that unified consciousness in terms of identity, then you see other people's problems as your problems. And we don't have to rebuild or start from the beginning. Right on, right on. <laughs> I would like to say something real quick. Dr. Otis, you right on point, because it's about that consciousness, right? And um, we got we got a lot of work to do. You know, we got to build some soldiers. You know, it's hard to go to war without soldiers. And right. we, we got to really build up our intellectual community. And people got to be serious. I always said you got to live, live and die with your convictions. You got to be certain things you just shouldn't do. So, you know, we got to get folks, you know, consciously aware and be serious about it. In the sense of doing it, if you're not going to be serious about it. Like I tell my kids, poop will get off the potty. If you're either you gonna do it or you're not. So, you know, we definitely gotta have some more conversation and we gotta be more visual. 
in the in the black community, no one's visual. Everybody hiding out, you know, doing their own thing. <laughs> you gotta be more visual. Let people know what you're doing. I yep. see it all the time. Yeah. But thanks for that feedback. That was important. Lindsay, I, this is Crystal Becker. I'd like to make a point. I, I do I do think that uh, Dr. Williams is right on point and I, I would agree with what's being said. I often have conversations in my household to say that um, our forefathers built HBCU. So they built historically black colleges and universities on day labor work, cotton picking, cotton pickers, uh, maids, butlers, and, and they built those institutions on practically nothing, um, right. but they were built. And then when we talk about, even if we talk about just our Prince George County and the one of the wealthiest counties, and we say we don't own anything, but what our forefathers were able to do because of the sacrifices that they were willing to make. And the question is, what sacrifices are we willing to make to right. really say enough is enough? You know, this is the world that we are going to create for our youth and for our future. What I can say and where I see a spark is that I had three uh, 20 year olds and their three young men that in their 20s and their, their thinking is very different <laughs> than mine. They are not willing, <laughs> nor will they sort of work <laughs> for, quote unquote, the man. They are, they are moving in their own way, in a way that is befitting to them and calling out some of the things that generationally, perhaps they see myself and my husband to say, well, you know, you just go this way or you do it this way. And they're like, no, I, I'm, I'm going to do it a different way. And so I'm excited to see that and supportive of that um, because there's a nice blend, and I think that they may be on the road to something phenomenal. Um, and I don't see it just in them. I see it in this generation of people. Absolutely. And let me chime in on when we talk about sons, right? My son is 27. He graduated from Morehouse 2016, right? Mm -hmm. And um, he's sharp. And I learned a lot through him. And you're right. They, they, they do think differently. So mm -hmm. I say, well, the world will flip-flop on me. So you got to teach me. And, and we just got to encourage our, our, our young uh, children to just be just to blossom. I say, well, you you were able to grow into your manhood. Well, I had baptism by fire. So mm -hmm. it's a good and Jill Scott's things about that that you, you know you want your kids to be smarter than you and do well. So we just gotta keep building on those, keep building on that. And eventually things will get better. And I always say tell uh, my people that I work with and my students that <clears throat> your first teachers are your parents. Like my father's been in jail 48 years, right? Since I was in kindergarten. But he's my first teacher. And you know what he taught me about the um the Tulsa race rides. He said, well, you know, Charlie Wilson had a song. I'm like, what you talking about? He said, "Drop you dropped the bomb on me, the Gap Band. Mm -hmm. And you know what the Gap Band stands for? The three major streets of, of Black Wall Street, Greenwood, Greenwood Archer, and Pine. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why his song, You Dropped the Bomb on Me, he slid it right by us. He was talking about Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. My father taught me that from prison. So yeah. those are the things that we got to elevate consciousness on. That it's, it's people out there that's doing some things, but it's individual stars yeah. instead of collective stars. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there we go. We right back at it, right? So we're 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 recognizing that the work is being done, y'all. And I think, mm -hmm. and I think all of us are doing the work in our pockets. And I think that's why it's important that we come together in, in forums like this to to really share what that work is and then figure out how we continue to do it collectively. Um, and and uh, Crystal, you said something around this idea of like our forefathers were able to do it with less. And so what does it look like for us to have to sacrifice now? What do we have to give up mm -hmm. in order to get that? And I think we are in a generation where they're not ready to give nothing up anymore. They decided they're going <laughs> to keep it and still build. OK, and I and I and I used to be like, well, no, we got to do it because I was raised in this idea that you had to have you had to let something go in order to build. And I think mm -hmm. our, our younger generation has come on to something. Right. And I'm like mm -hmm. trying to get with them now mm -hmm. because they're you know, I'm thinking about even just your, your beyond and your Jay-Z's who are not just thinking about themselves, but their generational wealth and how they're passing that down to their children and their children's children. And I think people are doing it, but we need to figure out how to do it 
on a bigger scale because we are not just making up for the last couple of years. We are making up 400 plus years. Um, and every time we've gotten ahead, them burning it down and dropping bombs on us, right? And so I think we are at a place now where we can come together and say, this is what I got, what you got, how are we gonna put these together? How's it gonna make sense? And, and I think somebody, um, um, Reverend Ray, I think it was you who was talking about, we gotta own the land right? It, it really starts there. It really does. Because when we have some control over what it is that we're doing and what it is that we're educating and who it is that we're sharing, in order to do that, we got to be in control of some things. And mm -hmm. we still aren't, right? We are on the outskirts. We are on the, the places where we can have a little bit of this. And yeah, we finally got a head coach job, but we still don't own a team and, you know, right. and all of these <laughs> things. And so I think we are, we are slowly moving in the right direction. And, and I'm going to venture to say that we don't need to give it up. We need to hold on to it and we need to continue to build because I, I've, I, I have a daughter too, who's in her twenties and she just told me that she wasn't going to do it my way. And I said, you know what, that's fine. As long as you're doing something right. And I think that that's where we got to get to is that we got to recognize that the, the way in which it goes about, it hasn't worked when we tried to do it anyway. So we might as well let that stuff go and really come together and think about it. And, um, Dr. Lewis, I see that you wrote in the chat, but we're going to hold questions because I want to give folks a little bit of time just to answer this last one. And then I'm going to open it up to the audience for more questions and we'll, we'll get to yours in just a second. So anybody else want to touch on that piece and, and what is it that we, how we thrive in, how we, how we, what we bringing together, what we doing? Well, Reverend Ray, let, let me also say this. We have to support each other. Uh, we can't, and we have to hold each other accountable. I mean, we have more black politicians than we ever had before. So why are things not better? Uh, you know, we got we we got more people making more money than they ever did before. So why are things are that better? Uh, but but we have to uh, support each other. And 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 hear me out before you all jump on Bill. Uh, Bill mm -hmm. Bill uh, uh, Bill Cosby. Now, next to God and Santa Claus, he probably was the most popular person in, in the country and in the world, Bill Cosby was. Now, and, and I don't know how many people know the backstory to Bill Cosby. Now, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, for, for what he has done personally with these women and stuff. I, I'm, 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 I'm not, you know, saying that I support what he did and everything or condone what he did, but the undercurrent of why he, you think that these people didn't know Bill Cosby been doing this for years. Okay. Now what happened was that's ready. The, the network came up for sale. Okay. And Bill Cosby was going to buy the network. They told him to back off. They did not want no black person on that network. I won't name the network. You can go and find all that out. They told him, leave it alone. Okay, so Bill Cosby, well, you know Bill Cosby, he Phil he's strictly Philadelphia. Okay, you know Philadelphia people, them people throw, throw snowballs at Santa Claus and stuff. So he was not going to leave it alone. So he was going to go around, you know, all the people he knew to, to get money to help buy this. So what they had to do, they had to destroy his credibility uh, before he couldn't buy that station. Now, once they destroyed his credibility, None of these uh, people like Denzel Washington, uh, none of them would, you know, financially uh, uh, support him. That's what they had to do. They had to destroy his credibility. Like I said, I don't support what he did. But you're going to tell me that they didn't know what Bill Cosby was doing for years. For years, they didn't know what he was doing. Not until he decided to try to own the station. All righty. Uh, that means he, you know, regardless, he would have hired more black people. They would have had control and stuff like that. But the okie doke was that us as black people, instead of us dealing with Bill Cosby, not dissing him and all and kicking him off that pedal stone or kicking him off a, a, a decision making where he still hired a lot of black people and all and stuff like that. We have to start supporting and looking at our own people when they having a situation. You know, that's one of the things, like I said, a lot of people might get mad about Bill Cosby and, you know, and everything, and everybody just had to diss some stuff up so easily. 
we are, you know, we, we are so duped so easily. Uh, and we have to start supporting our own people. We, we really have to, you know, really, really do. And I just bring that as the one example, but certainly there, you know, there, there, you know, there, there are many others, but um, so, so health wise, it, it just goes back to what we showing our kids. I talked to some millennials not too long ago and they say, Reverend Ray, let me tell you something. They say the the uh, the baby boomers they 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 uh, they failed us. They say you all baby boomers were the you know you all uh, was was the 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 the, the miracle uh, 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 kids. You know you all you know do it did all kind of stuff. Didn't worry about getting a job and you even put, you know all this kind of stuff. Y'all didn't save money. Y'all didn't do all this other stuff. Our four the your grandparents and all they try to coming from the South to buy homes and they thought buying a home was great and, and all, but then y'all baby boomers, you know, you all selling mom and grandma house and want to move an apartment and buy all this furniture from Marlowe's and uh, furniture and hood and all these places stuff. Say you all is baby boomers and the Gen X that came after the baby boomers, they so doped up on McDonald's. But once we started going to McDonald's, then we start feeding them kids like, McDonald's used to be a treat. Then we started feeding those kids like three times a day at McDonald's. So the millennials just totally um, have no respect for the baby boomers. They feel like the baby boomers uh, was the ones that was like now 78 million baby boomers or something. And, uh, but, you know, but they feel that just that the baby boomers did not uh, secure a future and a place for the Gen X and the Millenniums and now whatever this new group is called. So, you know, so that's that's that that's where I see it right now. I mean, Reverend Ray, you always tell us so much. I got about 20 different things and thoughts that are running through <laughs> my head about which direction we can take that in. Um, and, and so what I'm wondering now is that as I'm looking at Dr. Lewis's question here, she asked, how do we structure mentoring programs in the schools and how do we stop our youth from becoming a crime statistic? And can each school set up a mentoring and counseling services for youth? And these are some questions that that I think what, what you're getting at, Reverend Ray, is that what are we doing now to make sure we're not failing the generation coming behind us? And so, and, and how does that look? And, and, and what do we do to ensure that our young people have the support and the services that they need to thrive? And so um, I have some thoughts on it, but I wanna hear from you all first. And then again, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat. And I will, um, I will cue those up for us as we, as we start to close out. Um, thinking about, you know, now I'm in a middle school. Um, so I work with like sixth through eighth grade um, in Prince George's County. And our county does offer a lot of uh, support and programs for students. However, what I do find is that sometimes, um, when we are structuring like mentoring groups, maybe we say there's a criteria, right? We say, oh, well, they have to have a, a 2.0, right? Or I'm going to just select, like we've had mentoring programs and maybe they just select the kids that have good behavior, right? That, that aren't causing any issues. Um, what happens, I think we miss the mark. If we are truly trying to be a mentoring program and um, like the question that um, Lois uh, posed about um, stopping them from being crime statistics, I think we have to be honest with ourselves. It's not gonna be an easy thing, right? But if we are um, creating mentoring programs, we really have to focus on those children that often don't have a voice. Maybe they're shut out because of, you know, whether it's an economic thing, um, it's a behavioral thing, whatever that is, I think we have to be cautious on how we form these groups, what are the criteria. And then also, just like we're pushing the education, um, when we're teaching, we have to let these children have a voice, like not trying to control every part of a mentoring program and really ask them and let them 
shape or facilitate where that program goes. Um, so there's, there's, you know, a lot of pieces to that because I know that we have programs and things look great on paper, but when you are actually in it and you see what happens when you're in these buildings, sometimes I think we can miss the mark. Absolutely, absolutely. And I just want to say something real quick. Uh, Lindsay, I just sent you uh, some email about a host of um, programs that have mentoring programs, Greenbook Cares. Maybe you can share share, share with your screen so folks can, can uh, have that information sent to the email. But but the parents got to participate. Parents should be initiating. I mean, the school is fine, that's secondary, but the parents got to participate because they, they brought these kids in the world and they kind of just plop them on us in these school systems. And there's only so much we can do. But maybe you can share the screen if you have time with all the programs that's been offered. Because you gotta be, you got you gotta get approved to be on Prince George's County mentoring list. So I sent that information to the email. And and if I can add, so um, about twenty years ago when I was teaching uh, middle school special education in um, Baltimore City, what I started was a after school uh, rites of passage program. So what I noticed was that. Um, you know, traditionally in African societies, we prepare our young boys and our young uh, girls to become men and women. And in the United States, we really don't have a, a formal process in terms of preparing. Um, the closest thing would be school. And graduation is that marker in terms of transitioning from a boy to a man. Um, and so most recently in Prince George County, about seven years ago, I had a, a program, um, we ran out of funding and I'm actually partnering with a colleague of mine at Bowie State now to start another program, which we should be starting in this late spring or probably early summer. But what our Rites of Passage program is doing is teaching these young men how to become men, teaching them pro-social skills, teaching them how to um, do their finances, teaching them about culture, history, and so forth. So we would, well, what I was doing in terms of um, Prince George's County was I would come after school around 2.30 and we would stay for two hours, but we would do these African um, rituals. We would teach them African drum, African dance. We would have guest speakers come in and talk about male, female relationships, finances, um, yoga, and all sorts of activities. And this would go throughout the entire semester, which would be about 16 to 20 weeks. And then we would end with an initiation ceremony where we invite the community their parents, their family members, friends, um, clergy, or whoever um, was close and dear and important to them. And this experience, well, first they had to complete the experience, but this ceremony marked um, us introducing the community, um, well, introducing these young men to the community as now young men, along with all of the responsibilities that that entails. So I think that we need to, um, the academy, such as Bowie State and other academies and other community institutions need to invest this time into our schools. Um, and like Brother Darren said, the parents need to buy into these things because if you don't have the parent support, if the parents are talking about these things after um, they leave from us, then that's what's needed to support and reinforce the ideas that we're talking about. So it's not just really an, uh, a program for the students and for the youth, but it's also a program for the parents. Once a month, we will have a parent um, session and I'm kind of ashamed to say this, but like out of the 15 boys that we would have in the group and that once a month meeting that we would have for the parents, we would get like a 20, 25% turnout rate, the parents. And this was just once a month. So you all have, again, brought up some very, very, um, some very good things. I'm going to keep it open just for a little bit to see if there's any other things. And then I'm going to give us some other ideas that I have as well. So um, anyone who hasn't had a chance to go yet, if you, you want to add into that. I know not all of you work with youth either, so this might be out of your purview. But if you have some ideas, share them, please. Yeah, I'd just like to share, Lindsay, again, this is Crystal Becker. I don't have the opportunity to work with youth every day. Um, I am proud to say my oldest son is a teacher, um, but he's in the Anne Arundel County school system. But one of the things that we are working with the Academy of Health Science with Prince George uh, Community College, they have a health and science uh, high school 
uh, that we're working with them to be able to offer an internship, a paid internship. Um, over the summer. And so we actually are meeting with them. We've had a couple of meetings with them already. Um, and we are have another scheduled meeting here in the next couple of weeks that we're hoping to have everything in order so that before the children are graduating, um, you know, uh, this year, that they'll be able to hear about these opportunities. And so at least if they're considering uh, something in healthcare, it doesn't have to be a nurse, it could be any opportunities in healthcare, that they'll have the opportunity to actually be in the healthcare setting. So when they do finally determine uh, what they would like to do, that they've had some type of experience. And so that's one of the things we've we, we hope that we won't have to put it off because of the pandemic and we'll be able to get them in here, but we are, are working on that and so that we'll be able to launch that in the summer. Okay, okay, Camille, did you have something or you, I saw you kind of reach, so. Oh, no, I was just, um, I think that's a great opportunity. Our principal, our former principal is now the principal of health and sciences, um, Dr. Valentine. And I know she's trying to do yes, a lot of things nice here. I love her. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful to hear about those things. And I think it's so yeah. important with everything that we said, if we were all taking a piece, um, which sounds like what is being done, um, that, you know, that sometimes it's the small steps, you know, that make a larger impact. Um, so I'm just happy to hear that. I think it actually, it's not even sometimes, it's always, it's those small steps. The, the thing is that we need to lift them up. And I think that that is what's the piece that's missing is that we are hearing a lot about the crime and, and the things that um, some of our young people are involved in, but we're not hearing all the good stuff they're involved in. And there are so many opportunities, particularly here. I'm from Wisconsin and, and I didn't have opportunities um, at the ready and they still don't have opportunities at the ready um, like they do in this area. And our, our young people here are very fortunate to be able to have um, access to so many um, so many programs and, and all types of things. And I think one of the key things, Crystal, that you said is that it's a paid internship. Um, a lot of our young people are not here to do work for free. Um, and so, you know, I think if we if we really want to to curb some of the crime and some of the things is that they not only want their voices heard, they want to be able to contribute and they can't contribute if they can't contribute financially, if they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And so I think a lot of even if we're thinking mentorship or things like that, if we can find opportunities to um, help our young people make some money, and that's usually going to be the way that we're going to get them in because they're they're going to have um some more resources to be able to do the things that they're trying to do. And so ultimately, you know, I think we have a couple of things that I feel came up is like, we need to center our youth and we need to center their voices, right? So giving them the opportunity to share what, what it is that they're doing and where they going and what, and what um, initiatives are important for them. Cause they may not have the same ideas and thoughts that we do. I've learned that um, sometimes the hard way and um, making sure that we have um, some funding you know, that is geared specifically towards our young people. Uh, I, I know a lot of us want them to do community service and we want them to give back freely and all of these things, but when they don't have someone pouring into them in that way, it's very hard for them to give up what little they do have. Um, and, and that may just be time. And so we require it that they get these service hours in order to graduate, but are we requiring that they, somebody else is paying them to do some work as well? And so we just need to start thinking about our models and how we are showing up in the world and educating our young people what we used to do don't work and it didn't really work then so why are we still doing a lot of that stuff we want to start breaking down and dismantling some of those systems particularly those that are rooted in oppression in this prison to school pipeline like we we got to remember that we aren't preparing our young people to go to prison but if we keep teaching them the way that we've been doing that's exactly what we're preparing them for and so um I, as an administrator in the schools I, I see it every day and I'm, I'm constantly fighting against a lot of the systems that are just designed to keep our young people in these boxes and keep them behaving well rather than exploring and expressing. And so um, those are some of the ways in which I hope to continue to do this work and giving opportunity for our young people to, to shine and share their voice, whether it be I, I particularly like the arts. So I'm going to always use that as my catalyst. But we have some great engineering programs, and it's great to hear about these health and science programs. So there are so many 
many things out there that we just have to connect our young people to. Um, and you all mentioned that it's important to involve the family. And so I wanted to just mention that sometimes we're asking kids to bring parents that they don't have. Right. And so we got to be careful with our language and saying, well, it's a parent's night. Well, they might not have a parent. They might have a grandmother. They might have an auntie. They might have someone else who's looking after them. And so making sure you are actually inviting the caregiver um, to show up for these things, because you may get a little better turnout, because if they didn't feel like it was for them, then they're not coming. Um, and two, also recognizing that if we're doing stuff for for our families to be involved, to make sure that we know that maybe they got two and three jobs. So trying to come in the morning is best or trying to come in the evening is best and really asking those questions of our community so that we can better serve them, I think is the key. Um, and then lastly, this education piece that we've kind of threaded through all of here, I think we want to make sure that we are centering um, our knowledge share, right? We all have a lot of knowledge. Our young people also have a lot of knowledge. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, even just having some, some mentorships for, our, for those folks who have disabilities or maybe technology is not your thing. Partner with some of these young people. That was one of my favorite things to do as a youth was to show somebody how to use something. So, you know, I, I think we have some opportunities here that we can definitely um, use and, and, and hopefully engage our young people to feel like they belong in our society, because if we continue to put them as outcasts, they're going to continue to tear stuff up. And, and so that is that is a known fact for generations. So um, I want to open back up. I know I asked you all if you in the audience had some additional questions, please, please ask your questions while we are here. And if anybody else has anything they want to just chime in, this is your moment. This is your time to shine. Here's the mic. I'm passing it on. Uh, Reverend Ray, I, I just want to ask a question because uh, um, I won't call him a friend, uh, but uh, uh, a Jewish colleague of mine uh, said to me, he said, you know, Reverend Ray, y'all try to have all these mental programs and these youth programs, and really they just like many uh, boys towns. He said, because it don't go anywhere. He said, what? I, I said, well, what's the difference with you all? He said, well, we control our culture. He said, that's what you have to do. You all, he said, the, the, he say our Jewish kids, be, when the time they born, they know what's expected of us. And I asked a Latino friend of mine, he said, well, the same thing. They, those cultures, they know what's expected of them. Yeah, they're still taught, but they know they carry themselves a certain way. He said, uh, with, with, with you all, and I saw it keep going back to black people. He said, with you all, they, y'all don't have an expectation. Uh, you know, the way he said, when I hear the jokes about the black jokes y'all make, you'll say about, yeah, you know, your mama would knock you out if you did this mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And he said, but you all don't have a sense of a culture. Uh, I know your culture was taken from you. I know, you know, type, you know, your language was taken from you and your, your, you know, money, all that. He said, but uh, you all don't have a sense of culture. He said, a Jewish kid, no you know, from the time he born, what's going to happen and what direction he's going to go, you know, uh, and, and also, I, I don't know how we create the culture. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know how we create the culture that we need, but um, we, but we have to look at, um, uh, you know, we, we, we have to look at, at the culture uh, uh, for our Black, our Black youth. You know, like what's expected of them? I mean, do they have like a rallying point or something like that? You know, or whatever. I mean, that's how they can get caught up in these gangs and all these gangs and all this kind of stuff because they want to belong somewhere. So I, I mean, I struggle with that. I don't know what the culture is. Uh, you know, I mean, kid, know he gonna, you know, and Jewish, uh, he gonna go to a bar mitzvah at a certain age and all this kind of stuff and everything. So I don't, the cheese mode of Latino people, uh, men. I mean, so I don't know, but it's a culture. It's a culture we got to create. Uh, like Arthur S. said, he was a race man, you know, and he tried to exhibit that. It never caught on, I don't think. Uh, and when people asked me when I had to do a, a, a presentation the other day, I told them, you know, it's the four gospels that I'm, I, I try to teach the black kids 
And they said, well, Reverend Ray, oh, you talking about, Ma, um, uh, uh, you talking about Matthew, Ma, uh, Matthew? I say, no, no, I'm talking about my from X. Uh, I'm talking about Martin Luther King, uh, Mandela, and, my, and, and Marcus Garvey. I mean, you notice when Marcus Garvey, at one time Marcus Garvey in the U in the in the in the, in the UNIA, he had uh, over two million uh, members, and you know, and the things that he was doing, and then they got you know got a brother to bring him down and stuff. So he again, it seemed like every like a, a white fellow told me to told me that too long ago. He said, Reverend Ray, when y'all black people playing uh, checkers, we're playing chess. Okay, so it seems like every time we get to a certain point, they pull a rug from under us. And I just don't know, you know, what we need to do as leaders. At one time, we could count 10 leaders on our hands. Right now, who is a popular leader that we can really point to and say, oh, this, you know, three or four leaders? We, we don't even have that anymore. So there's just a number of things we got to get together and work on. And um, yeah, I, I, you bring up some good points. And I think, um, um, Dr. Williams, you were saying earlier that y'all started this rites of passage program. And I think that that is actually your answer right there is really finding the um, indigenous roots and figuring out where is that rites of passage? What what sends us from childhood to adulthood? What is that, right? And, and a lot of those cultures that you were mentioning, Reverend Ray, is that those are cultures that say at this age, you are now, you're passing, right? You're passing from this from this point into this other, to this point. And we don't have that as a black community because you're right, it was stolen from us and it was kept from us and it continues to be stolen from us because every time we start to try to create some of that, there's something that comes back up around this white supremacy that just doesn't seem to want to let it go. And so, you know, I think that there is, um, I think about, you know, our fraternities and our sororities is that um, when we get st uh, students who are going to college and they're finding that, that rite of passage there or finding these different organizations and places to be in order to create that, but not all of our youth have that access. So how do we bring that directly to the community without, um, as I think Camille, you were saying, putting these stipulations on it, where we have to have, you have to have the 2.0 or you have to have this, where how are we opening it up to all of our young people and, and letting them know that they are just as valued and just as important as the next person, regardless of what their situation is. And I think that that is, that is the work that that's going to be ongoing and it's going to take some of something of everybody to show up and do that because our society has demonized particularly our black boys so much right which is also why i even struggle to have a conversation on how do we stop the crime in our with our youth because we're demonizing them once again it's not yeah. the crime in our youth our youth are fighting for their lives right now and so you know at the end of the day we need to start looking again from that wellness perspective and saying how can we continue to uplift them what services what um what things do they need in order to think about how they can show up in a world that has not given them anything and is continuously taking everything away and so it is a struggle y'all we we got some work to do but i do think that if we continue to come together and continue to provide these resources and and really do that groundwork where we're going directly to the young people we we can do it because i've seen it happen and i've watched and witnessed a lot of young people who may not have had all of the opportunities, but because someone believed in them, were able to show up and do what they needed. And so that is, you know, as a therapist, I always say it just takes one healthy adult, right? It takes one person <laughs> in your life to show up and do that for you. But if everybody you know is dead or in jail, who's that person, right? And so as a community, we do need to stand up and support um, all the young people who don't have someone standing in the gap for them and really, and really do that work. Um, so thank you for bringing those up because those are some some things that are near and dear to my heart for sure. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open it. And Darren, yes, I'm still gonna share your, um, your 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 sheet that you sent, but it looks like to that I can send it to Lewis and she can um, she can send it out. Can um, I add something real quick about the culture piece. Hey, cool. Uh, and I wanted to just kind of um, emphasize. I, I think. Most of us actually know the importance of, well, I'm going to say most of us, many of us know the importance of culture um, because that culture piece is what we talked about earlier in terms of consciousness. Um, and so when we have these programs that talk about the importance of culture, African culture and so forth. As I stated before, if we don't, if that's not important to the parents, then mm. It's, mm. it's still difficult. And, and I keep going back to the parents and, and I'm not talking, I, I know that there are 
you know, I'm more than just parents and guardians and so forth. What I've witnessed in terms of what I was talking about earlier, um, having a meeting with the parents, the meeting was actually right after the program ended. We would have uh, parents or guardians come pick up their children and not stay and go home. Um, so we're not really talking about transportation issues. We're not talking about time issues and so forth. And I've seen this time and time again. If it's not supported or um, reinforced at home and it's just a thing at school, and that's where it, it, it becomes something separate. And what we're, we're talking about is changing people's paradigms, people's lifestyle, their way of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. And not just something that happens two days out of a week for two hours. Mm. Lois, you have your hand up, so I'm gonna let you go and then I'm gonna bring in some more pieces. Um, I, just, I just wanted to say that I don't, um, I don't think that, um, oops, I don't think that our children are challenged in school. Uh, there's my favorite little man. I don't think that our children are challenged in school. I don't think their brain power has been utilized. And I think part of the reasons that they get so distracted, um, and I think some of the reasons they get so distracted is because they're smarter than the people teaching them. And the people teaching them are not recognizing that you've got some pretty smart children. I mean, I am, I am almost sure, for example, that Jay-Z was dismissed in school because I know where he went to school. He grew up near where I grew up. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I am of the, of the belief that until we have teachers that go into that school and teachers that say, this is what we're going to do. And yes, there will be there. Every parent is not going to be there because some of the parents are working two and three jobs. They, 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 they and it is true. I know one of the things that the Spring Hill Lake Elementary School that they started doing is having parents come in the morning because that's when they were, many of them were available. But our teachers have to challenge and we have to start challenging the teachers because I don't, I know some of them are really fantastic. Camille, I know, I know, <laughs> I know, but I don't think particularly in the elementary school in the foundation area, I just don't think they're challenging our, our kids. And I don't think the parents, um, especially if you're immigrant or if your language is in English, know or believe um, or can believe what's being said about your children. And, and I watched this over and over again. And, and, I've, and, I've, and I've seen children who were written off um, be placed in challenging environments and blossom. And that happens over and over again. So unless our schools are willing, and especially the schools like you said, Reverend Ray, in Prince George's County, where people don't want to bring quality businesses here because of what's going on in our schools. That's a slap in the face of every parent who has a child in a public school, but it's also a slap in the face of the teachers. So I think we need to pay closer attention and challenge what is happening to our kids in the public school. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of that has to do with recognizing that it's not what it used to be. We still trying to teach what we used to teach. I, I, I can't stress this enough. I was that child who wasn't challenged and bored and slept through class because everything was boring. And, you know, I got had to write sentences and go to detention and all kinds of stuff. I wasn't a bad kid. I just was bored out of my mind. And I think that um, you, you have a point there. Like we really do need to challenge our young people, but we need to, we need to challenge our young people to show us what they need because they are miles and miles ahead of us. My little guy who just showed up here, he's six and he can't read. Yeah. He just turned six. 
Um, and so I'm getting phone calls from school about his I ready test and how he's not able to read, but I guarantee you he can navigate any video game, any <laughs> tablet, any everything else. Right. And so I'm like, does he need to read because he's doing fine everywhere else. Right. But we have these standards and these check boxes that we're so busy checking off that is determining whether or not our kids are smart enough or they're good enough or they're getting funding enough um, because they they need to do exactly what it says on this checklist that is completely outdated and doesn't actually measure what it is going on in our world right now. And so um, there are some fundamental shifts that need to happen. Right. And, and I still believe reading is important. I love it. It's my thing. So that's not what I'm saying. What mm -hmm. I'm saying is it's okay that a six year old, someone who just turned six can't read, he's learning and he's getting there, but there are things that he can do. And if you're not challenging those things that he can do, telling him that he needs to read some words on a page when everything else in his life is digital is going to just be not the way it's not it. It's just not going to work. And so, um, in some ways, our youth are further ahead of us than we will ever be because they are the future. We, we still thinking about what our future was going to be like and thinking about what a Y2K, everything was going to shut down. Well, it didn't shut down. It was still mm -hmm. here and we still had to function and we don't have flying cars yet. Maybe we do. But the point <laughs> is, you know, I think we are at a place where we we do have to think differently about our young people and our communities and how we serve them because what we what we've been doing is not working let's just be honest and and you know i even my students right now i teach um three college courses right now and I, I'm constantly asking them, what is it that y'all need to know? Because I can tell you what I think you need to know, right? But I don't actually have a, a awareness of what they've been doing because I'm adjunct, so I'm not there all the time. And I also just, you know, what what, what level are y'all at? Because I'm in under, my undergrads are way different than my grad students, right? And the needs are different. And now when you factor in the pandemic, you know, I have some folks who they might be graduating, but they probably shouldn't be because they had two years of something that they didn't miss and there's some social skills or they were nervous to present in class. And I was like, what's going on, right? They haven't been in social situations in a long time. So we're kind of starting over with some stuff. So I think that we are, we are in this kind of big mixing pot right now where we've got to figure out how we do all of the things be well, show up for all the people, take care of ourselves and still fight you know, oppression at the same time. And mm. we're doing a lot. We are doing a lot. And so I want to offer us a little bit of grace as well as we have this conversation to know that those little pieces that we talked about and doing that little bit is building. Um, and, and we do need to figure out how we build that into a strong culture, because I do think it's possible. I think we can bring that back. Um, and we're going to have to define and, and decide that culture that we want it to be because ours was actually just stripped from us. And so, you know, ultimately, we, we've got some work to do. And, and I think the only way we do that is in community, right? So I didn't talk enough. Yeah. I'm supposed to be moderating. I'm sorry. I, this is what I live for though, y'all. So I get a little excited. Um, but yes, so those are, those are all things. Everybody has made great, great, great points. I hope I have, was able to reshare and rebroadcast. Did I miss anything? No, um, thank you. For uh -oh. Moderating. Can you hear me? No, go ahead. Just try again. Cause it was, it was, it's freezing. Okay. Um, I, I think earlier when my call had dropped and I got back on, I believe Crystal was um, speaking about some wellness um, initiatives that she has uh, been a part of for the nurses. Did you say that in the hospital? Okay. I think I caught the tail end of that conversation, um, but it made me think about educators and things that are needed in that realm. Um, in the schools, there is, there is a lot that is lacking. Um, and we know in, or I'm, I'm assuming that we all know that, you know, we don't even have a lot of people majoring in education anymore um, because of the salary. And, and we have a lot of people that don't really know what they're doing in, the, in, in teaching positions because maybe their change of career. Maybe they were just a mathematician. They figured, well, that means I can teach math. And that's not true. <laughs> so it's, there is an art to it. Um, but we have so many people that were not, um, they were not educators by choice, I'll say. Okay, so and it, it changes the whole dynamic. And then now we don't even have substitutes. So we have teachers that don't get breaks. 
And then what happens is they're irritated. And, you know, I don't feel that every child that comes in that building probably meets an adult that just smiles and says good morning. And just so many piece I mean it is sad it is it's sad and I'm not sure where we're going or what's going to happen or what's going to be the remedy and even having um we have a lot of summer programs that I know will be offered again this summer to supposedly you know fill the gap but it you know and it's maybe a computer generated program of but not really that interaction piece so I'm not sure I think maybe I'm just kind of sharing my thoughts but I don't have answers either um but I have wondered many times this year, like, I'm not sure what's going on or where we're going to get to, because it saddens me. Now, I'm in a position where I'm actually, I'm out of the classroom, but I've had to be brought into the classroom because two teachers quitting in one class within one year. But I volunteered to go in because these students, every time someone went in to cover, they said, oh, these are bad students. Uh, they're out of control. They're this, they're that. And I'm like, well, if that's how you see it, they can feel your energy when you go in there. And of course, they haven't had any consistency this year. And so I took over that class um, and, and it's been fine. I mean, it's only been a few weeks now, but I told the principal, I'm going to stay in here all year because they need it, you know, and this is for a reading class. But I wanted them, as soon as I came in, I come in with, you know, positive affirmations and guess what? They haven't been a problem for me. Yeah, they, they're they active sometimes. And, and maybe I give them a minute to just be active. But now we have to sit and, you know, we have to be creative. But unfortunately, so many educators are stressed. It's hard for them to just smile sometimes, you know, and, and maybe we need more wellness centers. Like I heard, you know, Crystal that she's putting in place for nurses. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to share that just from being like in that grind every day. Um, I see many teachers doing a great job and, and, and they're trying. Um, are we meeting the mark? I can't say that we're meeting the mark every day, but you know, I just wanted to share my thought. Thank you for that. I, I, they've had me come in a teacher first grade classroom and I don't have nobody's business teaching first grade. I work with mostly teenagers and young adults, so I don't know how I did it, but I had a great time. They kept me on my toes and we went to the bathroom a lot of times. So uh, <laughs> that is what happens in first grade, let me just tell you. And that's, and that's because of the shortages, right? And that is because we don't have enough people to cover and people are in quarantine and it has been a hot mess, if I may say so, okay? And I applaud all of our educators who are showing up in spite of um, and who literally have nothing left to give, but they still there, their body's still there. Um, they might not be mentally there, but their bodies are still there and they holding down these classrooms. And so it is it is tough. And I think that we we owe a great gratitude to the the many, I call them my frontline workers. I work in education, so they're my frontline workers. I know my nurses have been working hard too, but let me just tell you how these educators are showing up um, showing up and feeding kids who don't haven't had breakfast, showing up and making sure that kids got what they need and are just basic stuff, right? And so I think that that is the other key is that we need to figure out how to fund, right? You, you mentioned these salaries, but we need to not only fund our teachers, we need to fund our schools and they shouldn't have to decide between art supplies and face masks and sanitizer you know and and that's kind of just where we've been and I think that that is that is going to be a detriment for us in the future as a society not even just as a, a black people but as a society as a whole because we've got a bunch of young people who didn't have their basic needs met who are going to be our future leaders and they're going to remember <laughs> let me just be clear so I think we we've got some work to do there too to make sure that we are supporting our educators and, and, and our young people as well. And I like that idea of these wellness spots that y'all have with the massage chairs and all that. I mean, we need to figure out how we can just replicate that in, in lots of different spaces. I don't know if it's a case study or what, but we definitely need to figure it out. I think that we're so um, focused and heavily driven by teaching content um, that you know traditionally from an African center perspective, it was character that was most important. Um, and so we focused on or emphasized character and integrity with our students and community and just some basic values. Um, mm -hmm. And that other stuff would take care of itself in the end. Uh, math would take care of itself. Reading would take care of itself um, if we're able to. And then also control, right? So teachers want to come into a classroom 
and control a student's every move. Um, sometimes we just have to, as some, someone said, just allow them to be. Um, and then we can come back to reading after you have let this energy out. Because our students, um, they have a verb, uh, they have a rhythm, um, they have any they movement. Um, that's how we learn. And we don't emphasize that. We don't take, take advantage of that. We put them in a box with these four walls and we need your attention. And if we don't, then we diagnose you. All of these things are right. All of these things are true. And, and the key to that is that relationship. Right? Absolutely. Oh, that's, that's, that's it. And, that's you know, it made me think about when you said that, um, you know, this influx of social emotional learning and all that really is, is getting back to the basics of what is the character? How are you showing up? Who's showing up for you? Um, and we like to put all these fancy terms on it. We like to check all these boxes, but the reality is if we get back to those basics of just being human and holding, holding it into the things that we've always known to be true, right? And that rhythm mm -hmm. and that drumming and just knowing that there's a flow and an ebb that happens. Um, and, 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 you know, the whole world is our teacher. Why we gotta be in, in one little room and sit Absolutely. down and be quiet and line up and, oh, Absolutely. yes. I'm here yeah. for the liberation of Absolutely. our education, y'all. <laughs> I am. Mm -hmm. My daughter is uh, elementary school, um, but she's actually in her senior year. So she's an elementary ed major. She's doing her internship. And mm -hmm. just to hear her stories every day about um, there's so many things that they have to do outside of the classroom. Um, mm -hmm. and so that takes away from you know the teaching part. or um, yeah. And then there's always change. I remember when I was teaching, you know, depending on who was superintendent or principal, whatever, you know, it's like one program after another, there's never really any consistency. What you wanted uh, us to just let the teachers teach? Right. That's <laughs> foolish, right? That's foolish. Oh, one day I have a dream, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, y'all, we only have a few more minutes left. I want to see if our audience has any more questions. Um, I see that we had um, some folks in here talking about the, the parents and, and making sure that they are involved and, and how we work to help even change their mindsets. Because we got to also remember that many of our parents didn't have what we're asking them to, to give. Um, and so, so we, they might need exactly what we're trying to give these young people too. We just got to figure out how to get it to them. So. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Interns, we need interns. Send them from Bowie to Greenbelt Middle School. Okay. Absolutely. I actually yeah. might have some for you. Add another, yeah, at another school, we used to have um, Bowie State. This was in my, um, I think at Eisenhower and Laurel. But in Greenbelt, when we from the University of Maryland. I would love to see more HBCUs in there as well. Um, I don't think I've seen Bowie in there at least for five years. So we need to do something about that. All right, Dr. Okay. I'll, I'll talk to the department chair, Dr. Long. I know her very well. Yeah. Well, uh, Reverend Ray. Oh, go ahead, Reverend Ray. On education. Um, uh, me and my wife had to host a couple of uh, Black History Month trivial, <laughs> and it's amazing what we don't know about mm -hmm. our old Black history. Uh, one of, and, and, and we asked one of the questions was about um, how many, uh, what, what, what did, uh, 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 you know, H, H, uh, uh, H, 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 M, I mean, what what is it? You know, HBCU. Uh, yeah, yeah. What did that mean? A lot of people didn't know know knew what the initial was, and I guess because we say these this alphabets all the time. And the other thing question was, how many are there uh, in the United States? People didn't know it was 117. Uh, so there was a, a lot of history that we realized we didn't lost. You know, or we don't know about God and you know, and the uh, the traffic light. I mean, just a lot of things. I was just surprised that we just did not know. And I don't know if we not teaching it, but one of the things that the churches get mad with me about that I tell every church that every black church at least should have a black history, a 
class course and they should have a course on finances. Every black church should have that because uh, we need to know about money. I mean, we need to know how to, we can make it, but we need to know how to leverage it. And we need to know about our black history, you know? So, though, you know, so those are some of the things that I think we really need. And unfortunately, it starts with the black church. I mean, it really does. In our case, it starts with the black church. And in Prince George County, I don't know about Wisconsin or what city you live in, but we talk about education as far as money. In Prince George County, our budget last year was uh, $4.7 billion. And on every dollar, 60 cents of every dollar is spent on education. So why don't we have one of the best educated uh, systems in the world? That's a great question. I wish I had an answer for you. I've been trying to figure it out myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, and honestly, I'm wondering, it's not that it's not that, that it's not great. I think the system actually might be great, but it's just not meeting where the world is, right? We, we're just doing what we used to do and we, we need to, to start moving forward, um, right? Because I still know many people who leave DC to go to school out in PG because it's better than even some of the stuff that's here. And so, um, you know, I think that there are ways that we can do it um so yes i just want to thank y'all this was a great conversation i'm i'm really happy to be here with you all today and i'm hopeful that we can continue these conversations and continue this community so that we can continue to bring these resources and really really uplift our our young people particularly but all of us and and remind ourselves that wellness needs to be at the center um because if we aren't well we can't take care of anybody else we can't pour from our empty cups so we got to make sure that we are finding those things to keep us well um thank you all my lovely panelists y'all were wonderful i appreciate your time and your energy today and anybody want to I, I like to always close out with one word because that's just what i do so if y'all just have one word that you'd like to share with us today um just to leave us with something to linger and um we'll go ahead and close out my one word is garveyism garveyism all right now <laughs> My one word is hopefulness. Hopefulness. Thank you. Patience. Patience. I'm going to go with pride. Pride. Yeah. My one word is excellence. Excellence. Yes. Love. Love. Anybody else? All right, well, I'm gonna leave you with my one Robert word. Robert said kindness. Kindness, thank you, thank you. I see it in the chat now, thank you. Mine is partnership. Partnership, yes. I'm gonna say collective, because mm. I think we gotta do it all together. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank y'all. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Um, like I said, it was great uh, hanging out with y'all today and hopefully we can all stay connected. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless. Thank you. Have a good night. It's a pleasure. Take care. Mm -hmm.